welcome to Nerdstalker. I am Adolfo Ferranda. And I'm Greg Voria, AK Social Greg on Twitter. Hey, how you doing, man? Good, good, good. At Nerdstalker on Twitter. I always forget that, and I didn't put it in my lower third for you people that are watching. <laughs> Not too I'll, thorough. I'll fix here. that for you. <laughs> right, I blame Greg. Yeah. All right. <laughs> so just a reminder, everyone, to check out uh, your page, our Patreon page. <laughs> Yours too at patreon.com forward slash nerdstalker. We would love your patronage and support in these times of need. Uh, we should, we could sure use some support. Uh, and we do our best to give you some uh, great information and all that stuff. And so, all that stuff. And all that stuff. So, first story of the week, I'm going to get right into it. Mm. Restaurants across the United States are turning parking lots into drive in movie theaters. I love this. Since social distancing rules began in March, restaurants across America have begun turning their parking lots into drive-in cinemas, offering an opportunity to stir crazy couples and families craving a social outing such as dinner and a movie. People's Restaurant and Lounge in Corpus Christi, Texas is also a popular eatery that has seen revenue dry up since the outbreak of the coronavirus. However, when it announced on April 18th, that it would begin screening films in its parking lot, beginning with Toy Story 4. Customers, old and new, quickly flocked back to snap up tickets. Co-owners um, Jose Gonzalez told Corpus Christi Caller Times, we are in awe of how quickly we sold out of the tickets this week. Uh, the community's response to our drive-in has really made a huge impact for us. The idea was a result of family brainstorming. Really great. Uh, so they're having hard times trying to stay afloat through the carry-out delivery. Uh, it was co costing them more money to stay open that way. Uh, one of the daughters came up with the idea. Up north in Mingus, Texas, another restaurant also decided last month that it would be a good idea to revive drive-in theaters. In a Facebook post, Clint Gibson, the owner of BJ's Restaurant and Bar, announced that his restaurant would begin to start uh, films, beginning with baseball classic The Sandlot, while also offering old-school car-side service. He said, uh, when the world is shutting down, we have to go back to roots uh, of entertainment. Over the past weekend, BJ's also screened Tombstone, Dirty Dancing, charging $10 per vehicle while urging patrons to show up early to reserve a highly sought after spot. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> Excuse me again. Meanwhile, an Arizona Food and Wine reports that Ajo Al's group of Mexican restaurants set up inflatable screens in the parking lot with its various in order to screen the beloved Pixar film Coco to guess well, they park their cars six feet apart and enjoy some takeout chips, queso, brisket tacos, and bean dip. That sounds awesome. And in Omaha, Nebraska, Tex-Mex Cantina, the corner kick brought about 35 vehicles to their parking lot when they screened the classic comedy, The Three Amigos, uh, on three different screens across the side of the building. However, <clears throat> excuse me, the idea of pop-up drive-in theaters has also its challenges with some, the V Pizza in North Carolina, them being shut down for violating stay-at-home orders while others have faced legal problems from movie movie studios due to licensing issues. Uh, as Food and White notes, drive-in theaters first began operating in 93, long before the polio vaccine was developed. Prior to the widespread introduction of the vaccine, drive-ins were frequently advertised to parents who feared to expose their children themselves to local epidemics and as a place where one could be flu and polio protected. How interesting is that? I never knew that. Mm. Drive-ins had their heyday roughly up until the 60s, but a number of different factors, including the av availability of television, VCRs, video, rental shops, contributed to their decline. But for Gonzalez and Corpus Crispy, the revival of drive-in theaters is a matter of not just entertainment or business, but hope. He said, we really appreciate the backing we're getting from the public right now. The drive-ins give us opportunity to give back to our community and help us to stay open. It really makes us feel like things can really get back to normal again. Wow. That's cool. So yeah, I love it. During the, uh, you think this is gonna come back even after uh, this uh, shelter in place, or you think it's it's just a way to do, to just kind of bridge the gap for now? I, I think uh, I think more so bridging the gap. Honestly, uh, it's that's tough competition with. Uh, well, well, recently we saw the explosion of what was it? A, I forget the movie. There was a movie, a kids movie that was just released from screen directly to television. Uh, or I should say from Hollywood direct directly from television bypassing the cinemas and the cinemas are very upset about it. So, uh, and that movie particular movie did record numbers and sales 
than even uh, movie theaters would do. I think because the ease of availability of you just paying on your computer for a movie, right? And we've been saying this for a while, me and Greg too, that why not just fill this gap and get rid of the middleman to some extent or offer both, you know? I know it could be uh, detrimental to cinema business and that's unfortunate, but I mean, customers want what customers want. You know, and to uh, compliment then, who knows, maybe drive-ins would be a nice uh, addendum to that, to that potential offering. I don't know. But for right now, I think drive-ins are a fantastic stopgap and allowing restaurants to project on local, you know, buildings so that they they may or may not lease or whatever in parking lots. I think, God, you know, l let them go for it. Yeah, why, why not? It's not Hollywood and there's any legal, you know, issues. Yeah, well, we'll talk about that in a little bit, but but I think I think it's interesting that the uh, creativity I think is just of these these business entrepreneurs. I, I you just try to something that you know just try. You know, it's it's yeah. kind of a startup mentality. Just try something, and if it sticks, then you keep on doing it. You know. So, yeah, I love it. That's I good. Love oh yeah, 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 yeah. All right, Greg. Next story, man. Oh yeah. Well, um, you know that the way we kind of control um you know uh, being distracted by by our cell phones is actually you know in california while we're driving we have to put it actually up on a um a cradle and that's that's supposed to be legal but quite frankly guys i, I still get distracted by the darn thing <laughs> and yeah. looking over to the right and pressing something i mean come on you know i, I don't know if that was exactly the best solution so so uh thanks to zdnet for this a novel solution to curb uh phone use by drivers and thanks to greg nichols for this uh so uh, apparently you know there was many drivers i think there, i think i think there were over like 30 or 40,000 people injured due to accidents due to cell phone units last year. I know I got into an accident because someone was on a cell phone. So it's like, mm. I was just, I was just waiting for the, the stop sign and boom, they, they rear into me. And, you know, and I think it's one of those things, but uh, you know, with technology it is today, um, they have some apps, you know, that uh, maybe be able to detect if you're a driver or a passenger. And it just seems like it makes sense to me. Right. I mean, it's like, mm -hmm. why are we, dealing with this thing where you know you have to have it on the cradle and you know you have your two hands on the wheel and all this stuff and uh why not just you know come up with an algorithm that kind of detects this and that's what um the app utilizes here they say uh, the phone's camera continuously detect the user's context it uses common contextual clues that are standard across nearly all cars to determine if the phone is oriented for use by the driver or the passenger uh, for example, the so-called chicken handles overhead, the placement of, of the of the windows, the orientation right. of the sunroof taken together with the app's algorithm can use these clues accurately to tell who's behind the wheel or not. So uh, it, I, I don't know, you know, I, I think we, we need to use these powerful, um, uh, you know, uh, computers that we have in our, our mobile phones, don't we? Uh, what about, what about? What about you and how you, you said, well, we haven't been able to go out and drive very much recently, but before, um, you know, what, what did you, how did you curb your cell phone usage in the car and stuff like that? Well, no, I'm actually driving a lot right now, <laughs> um, but uh, uh, um, what, what I would say is that, you know, Waze actually, I'm an avid Waze user um, who are owned by Google or Al slash Alphabet, whatever you want to call them. They actually have a sort of a screen as soon as you turn it on right now that says are you sure you want you need to be going out you know kind of thing so sort of in, you know uh emphasizing this stay at home type of thing and then also once you're using and once you're driving and rolling if you punch into if you tap the field to let's say search for another address while you're driving it'll ask you are you sure you want to do this uh, do is this the passenger uh, kind of thing, right? To sort of emphasize, like you said, uh, not distract you from driving. You know, like if you're a driver, please, you know, don't, don't be like searching for, you know, addresses, whether it be gas stations or a separate destination that you're going while you're driving, pull over and, and sort of focus on the phone or something. Yeah, and you use, I think you use the cradle? You use the cradle uh, in like going into your uh, I don't know air ducts or do you actually have it mounted on the window or how do you do it? I, I have a I have a, something called a steely. It's an adhesive that it's a piece of metal adhesive to my dash 
and then I have a magnet attachment on the back of my phone, so I just, you know, it just goes right in. It's super handy. I love it a lot. It will demagnetize your credit cards if you have those Stripe credit cards and uh, not the chip option, so be aware of that because I've fallen prey to that. But, yeah, I think it's anything to curb uh, phone distraction is super important. That's cool. All right. Well, let's go to the next one. Microsoft will narrow its focus to software developers at this year's virtual build conference. What's that? Yes. Yeah. So I, lo I used to love the old uh, Microsoft conferences and we haven't been to a build in a while. So this has made me particularly happy that they're doing it online. Microsoft on Thursday announced that it'll start accepting registrations for its first digital only build developer con conference scheduled for May 19th through 20 to the 21st. Microsoft had originally planned to hold the event in Seattle, but canceled in-person gatherings in March as coronavirus became more prevalent. More than 6,000 people registered to attend last year's Build conference in downtown Seattle. Microsoft is now providing more detail on the substitute for one of its marquee activities that brings together employees with outsiders. This year's event will be free. That's awesome. And it will be more focused on the core audience of software developers rather than the end users of products like Windows 10 or Office applications or people interested in understanding bigger picture corporate strat strategy, which I love. Last month, Microsoft held a digital event for journalists to learn about new features in the Edge browser and other products. Build will see Microsoft delivering content for a larger audience. Executives will talk about AI technologies, the Azure Cloud, the Microsoft 365 family of products, including the Office Productivity Bundle. Basically, they're big money makers right now, right? Uh, keynote presentations at this year's Build event will be shorter, and some of the discussions that normally take place in person will happen on Twitter instead. Microsoft executives will be recording content ahead of time from their homes as they continue to shelter in place. Although some content will be produced live to enable greater public interaction, uh, the person said. Holding the event online will mean journalists won't have their usual press room available. Microsoft will provide a gathering place for, for journalists in the Teams communication app for this year's build. Earlier this month, Microsoft told partners that it had chosen to make all internal and external events into digital first affairs through July 2021. At some point, Microsoft will probably hold in-person conferences again, the person said. Other big technology companies like Apple, Facebook, and Google have also canceled or gone online only with major developer events. They had been planning for this year as COVID-19 cases mounted. On Wednesday, Salesforce called off its Dreamforce show for customers and partners. Wow, wow. So you think this is the new trend? Just, I mean, you know, this whole event, you know, we've, we've been part of this for many years as both covering it and, and part of events. I mean, this whole thing with this COVID has really turned that industry upside down, right? Yeah, I mean, um, think about the impact for those cities, for those conferences. Uh, that, those were major multi, multi-million dollar events. And Dreamforce in San Francisco is a massive, massive, massive event that em employs, geez, thousands of people, thousands of people. It's a huge economic loss to the city in terms of taxes and um, just people who work, you know, for their, for their pocketbooks. Yeah, it's a shame in a way. It's a shame, but it's great for developers and people who want easy, free. Well, the upside is that this is free, right? And right. and these conferences can be difficult to get into at times. I know Apple's is super hard to get into, um, and this is this is good for the developers. So ups and downs, ups and downs, right? Yeah, I man. I mean, All right. Well, Greg, next yes. story: twenty easy home office organization okay. ideas. To Let me go share minutes. my screen here and. Uh... This is a thanks to uh, Leon Ho of Lifehack, which I follow intensely uh, on my Feedly. So, um, you know, every 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 week I'll, I'll ask Adolfo what what he does. And I'm going to go through a few here. I'm not going to go through all 20, as I as I said <laughs> earlier, <laughs> in an earlier podcast. I'm not going to I'm not going to put you guys through that through that badness um so anyway um let's go through um let's see i think number five is one i wanted to ask you adolfo 
What do you think about this? Use binder clips to keep wires tidy. I thought this was pretty brilliant. Yeah, I love this tip. I, you know, Life Packer and all a lot of people like uh, suggest using this. Um, those big old binder clips that, that you use for these, you know, really thick type of files and stuff. They do. They they hold down. If you happen to have a table type of desk, you know, uh, where you can clip these things, they can't organize all kinds of things. I love the fact that they can hold the end of charging cables and and uh, they can sort of organize ethernet cables to some extent or whatever yeah there's so many different uses for these crazy things <laughs> the little robot man i like the little robot That's man yeah. <laughs> okay i'm gonna go to the next one I love um stuff. okay I, I don't know if i do this enough but have thoughts ideas or tasks jot them down in a productivity planner and i, yeah. I don't know well how, well how do you do this well bullet journaling is actually a very very popular sort of a, a practice productivity practice a lot of people do this uh, via paper instead of things like Todoist or, or OmniFocus or whatever the application that you may use mm. uh, for for being organized. So I think it's fantastic. Uh, allegedly, paper uh, seems to resonate with people more in terms of remembering things and, and the, the art of writing it down, the act of writing it down helps emphasize and enforce uh, what needs to be done and, and to remember certain things. So kudos to you if that's your jam. Yeah, good point. I write down all my meditations every day, so yeah, that's a good point. Okay, let's move on to something else that I saw down here I wanted to ask you about if you do, if Adolfo does. I just um, saw staying hydrated as I, I drink my water. Uh, I know. Um, this is interesting. Have reminders with bulletin boards. I'm not a big bulletin board guy, but I'm a good, I'm a good sticky note guy, so what do you do? Interesting. Yeah, yeah. no, I, I'm in a similar boat. I you know, for me, in terms of being distracted and stuff too, th these type of solutions never worked for me because it's just another thing on the wall, another sort of eye candy type of thing. Um, so they don't work well for me. They, they work well for others in my house that sometimes use these kind of things, but I need I need something all in one place that'll sort of remind me automatically. Todoist is my drug of choice, if you will, in this productivity space and reminder space. Um, but yeah, no, um, dry erase boards, no. Um, Bulletin boards, no. Sticky notes, no. It's just uh, I need one sort of place instead of a whole bunch of different ones on the door or whatever. Yeah, absolutely. But it works for people, so again. Yeah, yeah. I, I you know, I think I think what they have here is reminders or motivations, maybe. But I, I agree with you. I. I I get distracted quite a bit, so I think you and I are on the same boat. So, mm -hmm. uh, I just installed sticky notes for Apple and started using that, but eh, mm -hmm. you know, eh. You know. Yeah, I'll have to follow up with you to see how that's working. <laughs> yeah, <Why not? laughs> you know. Um, well, here's one I wanted to ask you about. When you have to focus, do you use headphones to block out any noise or distractions? I don't. I don't. I just, I probably should, and that's just because I don't, I don't know. I don't know why I've never done it. I think it's just because another thing, and I just mm. like to sit down and get to work if I can. But, but to uh, that theme, I, I notice that music does distract me when I, I when i can't read with music on that kind of thing and when i'm coding too or something like that when i used to code a lot uh, that's another thing that never really worked for me all that well it does for other you know like that, that type of like rain sounds or actually listening to jazz or some sort of other ambient type of music or, or whatever it may be uh again for me i'm hypersensitive to that kind of stuff so i, I must could be, be a, this could be an upside i don't know I must be more ADD than you are then because like I, I have to have a noise in the room when I'm actually focusing. Isn't that weird? Mm -hmm. So I have no, to have the no, TV no, no. on. Yeah, so, I used then, to have the TV on. Yeah. And when the, or, you know, something on and then I, I could focus. So, um. Yeah. All right, speed down. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Let's see. Uh oh. So yeah, Bo uh, Boy Genius Report is, is reporting that I was, 13.5 makes it easier to use face ID while wearing a face mask. You know, one of the tweets I had a, a while ago that got tra some traction on Facebook too was, I realized that, and I'm sure many of you did quite some time ago, that if you have a face ID device in during these times when you're required, at least in some places, to wear a mask of some sort, it's not going to work so great, right? And I've never been a big fan of Face ID. I hate it. I hate it. If I if there was a let's say Apple's iPhone, right? New iPhone had a Touch ID option, I would take it in a heartbeat. I hate it so much. I hate Face ID. And uh, when this happened, it only reinforced that seething hatred. And 
the issue right now that people are having with it is that it sees your face and Apple obviously did not account for this. So there's a slight delay before you're even prompted to put in your passcode, right? And apparently that slight delay is what they're seeing as a big solution of, in terms of getting rid of with this story. So the big hype of this story is that they're gonna get rid of that. I, I believe it's right, available now in their beta where all you have to do is swipe up now. It's not gonna, there's no longer gonna be a delay or it will automatically go to your passcode without delay, I believe. Um, and the thing about the new passcodes too, I believe there's six. They need to be yeah. six. Digits. Yeah, there's six. Four. Yeah, there's six now. Six. Yeah. And the old days it used to be four. So, it, you know, it takes that much longer to to get to just utilize your device. So kind of a drag. I was hoping they would order uh, have some sort of option where it would just use your eyes or you know something like that uh, versus uh, having to use your passcode again. So apparently that's the big news. I mean, you don't phones. use fingerprint at all. Well, I don't have that phone. I have a Face ID phone, oh. so there is no no touch button there is no button anymore on the new Apple yeah phones. that's right i'm so sorry i have an I, iphone 8 plus so i it's the last yeah. one i think See, the last I mean, one that's, that great. Had that. that's great i love i love that phone i wonder I if the, oh phone. the se must have got rid of it too huh the new one that came out i gotta check that I'm one not out sure about that but yeah. yeah i believe so i'm sure there's no way they'd go back you know i they would see it as going back although a oh lot of people gosh. really do miss that Oh my gosh! Well, you, you, when I go out, I have to use gloves, so the face ID would actually help. Mm. You know, mm. so you know. Good so point. in this Good case, point. all right. Speed round, speed round. <laughs> all right. <laughs> okay, Zoom users, here's here's a here's a freebie for you. Google's making Meet free for everyone. If you haven't heard about Google Meet, uh, it's the uh, Google's business level video conferencing service is now free for anyone with a Google account. Normally, you have to subscribe to G Suite and to use G Meet, but over the next coming weeks, Google is moving that barrier. So they announced that this week in a blog post, and uh, they want to, you know, they say it wants to keep service secure and reliable, which is kind of a poke at our friend Zoom, of course. And then, you know, with Google Meet, you can chat up to 100 people simultaneously. Um, mm -hmm. I'm not sure I'd do that, but it could come in handy, I guess, yeah, if you have a big party. So mm -hmm. um, 16 of them only could be displayed at one time. And um, they're not going to be limiting the minutes like Zoom is uh, to uh, 60 minutes right. till after September 30th. September, yeah. So, hey, let's do the next podcast on uh, Google Meet. I have Google Yeah, Meet, let's give so. that a go. And, you know, I was laughing when you first said it because you said Google's going to make meat free. And I thought, oh, like meat that you eat? <laughs> I sounds like so I'm like wait so I think that we could have just stumbled on an unfortunate naming of a product right G meat is what you called it too for a while there and uh, I could yeah. hear some pretty funny things going on with that one <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> some memes are gonna be popping out with that anyway oh, <laughs> All right, so condom manufacturer Durex says sales are down because of the coronavirus lockdown is, is quote, having a toll on the number of intimate occasions, unquote, reports The Guardian. The demand for rubbers will probably bounce back after the pandemic subsides, but manufacturers are concerned that current latex shortages could mean supplies won't meet the pent-up demands for condoms in the near future. Durex, the manufacturer, Rec Beckinser, said it demands... It, it expected demand for condoms to recover when the lockdown ends and said its condom factories would not scale back productions. Added that in China, the slowdown in sex during its lockdown and recovered and condom demand was back at the same levels as before the crisis. There have been concerns of a global condom shortage because strict lockdown rules in Malaysia. One of the world's top rubber producers and a major source of condoms had made it difficult for condom factories to operate. Carex, the world's largest condom producer, which makes one in five of all condoms, has warned of a global condom shortage after closing three of its factories. The firm said ex it expects to produce 200 million fewer condoms than usual from mid-March to mid-April. Whoa. Uh, so, honey, I love you six feet away. Yeah. yeah. Speed round, speed round. Disney. All right. Well, you know, um, thanks to um, Lifehacker again, another source that I use, I uh, read regularly. Um, learn how to draw from Disney animators through these free videos. So uh, animators, animators, sorry, animators. <laughs> Anim did I say animators? Oh, you made animators. up another word again. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
Greg Dictionary. <laughs> I had that, yeah, I had that to my Greg Dictionary. Um, just look it up on Google, Greg Dictionary. Anyway, um, so uh, Disney Parks has a number of videos that may help you if you want to become an animator. So the How to Draw series on YouTube offers videos on how to draw everyone from Elsa and Anna from Frozen to classic characters like Donald Duck and Goofy. So each video is hosted by actual Disney animators. So uh, it's about five minutes long and uh, check it out. There's like, uh, I think there's 42 different character videos the article says. So wow. if you want to be an animator and you're, uh, Love it. that's your dream, go do it now. It's it's absolutely free. So Super thank cool. you. Tip All time. right, tip time, ding, ding. All right, so my tip is draw sql so draw sql has a section of database schema templates over 200 of them um which is fantastic so the, what schema database schemas are is sort of the back ba backbone of almost every application especially if it's server side or not i shouldn't say that it helps every application so all the information in terms of like registering information that needs to be stored somewhere it's stored in something called the database a database has to be organized in something called the schema right it's a way databases are sort of comprised of uh different labels first name last name credit card number um where data resides right and typically you have to come up with a team and you have to plan what would all these things be all these different labels and it's a great deal of work with your DBA database administrator to plan all this stuff out. The, what's beautiful about this is they have all these templates sort of preloaded and for all these different various technology stacks. Um, I'm sure for the for those of you that are watching video right now, I am sharing a screen of DrawSQL's various templates and what they're showing here is uh, different types of uh, use case scenarios. We have uh, something for something called Laravel Spark, which is SAS boilerplate. We have a WordPress uh, PHP, PHP content management system uh, database template and a cashier for a various application or refinery CMS content management system that's on Ruby on Rails uh, template. And it goes on and on and on. And there's a ton of them. So it's really wonderful. Check it out. It's really neat and interactive as well. So if I click into one of these, you it loads, I clicked on one of the templates for you people listening. <laughs> it's gonna be kind of difficult for you that are listening. It opens the schema and it's all interactive. So you can zoom in on a particular uh, section of the template. And as you can see, if it would zoom in faster, I got to use the, here we go. You can click on the various things like a label, uh, variable character identifier. It gives its uh, information, a host name type of thing, and you can out, and you can see its relation to the other parts of the table, your database. So very cool, and thank you to DrawSQL for this. This should be a nice sort of template for developers to get a really quick start into their development and application development. Wow, so this basically, if you wanted to create a database, they would show you different databases that are created in different applications, or actually it's links to actual, um, like like I saw a WordPress uh, SQL database in there as well. So I mean, how would how would a how would a person use this? Yeah. So what they could do is they they can clone it. I should have mentioned that, uh, which also pulls it into your Git repository or whatever repository that you use. So you can basically import this thing and edit as you will. So it's a wonderful sort of ramp up, a quick start into application development. That's crazy. Development. God, that's it. That is wonderful. Oh my Very god. Very handy. All right, tip time, tip time. All right, tip time. Uh, all right, well, uh, you guys wanted to do this, right? Of course, um, adding music to your Facebook profile. So thanks to How To Geek, Joel Cornell, about uh, for this. Um, the songs that express who you are can easily be featured on anyone's Facebook profile, and I didn't know this. I thought that was kind of cool. So to add music uh, to your Facebook profile, uh, start by installing the Facebook app on your iPhone. So this is through mobile. And uh, log into your Facebook account and uh, tap the profile icon uh, to view your profile. And then tap music to, uh, to uh, add any kind of music. And you could go search for things that define you, uh, jazz, smooth jazz. Uh, for Adolfo, it's punk. Um, and <laughs> sorry, <laughs> uh, and for anyone else, uh, you know, so I thought it was kind of neat that you could actually associate this. And I thought that was kind of a neat, uh, social hack.
for you guys today. So thank you so much right. to How to Geek for that. And, and you can find the links below for the uh, actual actual um, uh, article. So anyway, cool. All right, everyone. So thank you so much for listening and watching to Nerdstalker again. And uh, I am at Nerdstalker on Twitter, Adolfo Veranda. You can find all our information at Nerdstalker.com, Nerdstalker TV on uh, YouTube. And don't forget our patreon.com forward slash nerdstalker. And Greg, where can we find and get more information about you? Oh, go to Social Greg um, and also uh, go to the uh, About Us page on the Nerdstalker website. And you can see what my profile is and get in contact with me that way. Uh, and if you want to pitch an ar article to any one of us, uh, go ahead and uh, do it through that means there. So thank you so much, Adolfo. Great, great show as always. So thank you. All right, thanks everyone. Remember, thumbs up, subscribe, and give us a nice little rating wherever you, you listen to stuff. Take care. Be careful out there. I have no feeling anymore. She 